Welcome everybody to our today's masterclass by IFCN. The masterclass by IFCN presentations was created in response to a call from the member societies for more high quality, complementary online educational content. The series will provide a new presentation every month from top clinical neurophysiologists around the world, and each will include time for discussion with a lecturer following the presentation. So providing the best in contemporary clinical neurophysiology education delivered in the most optimal format is the primary educational goal of the IFCN. As such, the masterclass by IFCN will be available complimentary to all registrants. It's a particular pleasure to welcome today Professor Atif Hussein. He's a professor in the Department of Neurology and Chief of the Division of Epilepsy, Sleep and Clinical Neurophysiology at Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. He's also the National Director of Veterans Affairs Epilepsy Centers of Excellence. Dr. Hussein is currently the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Clinical Neurophysiology and uh, he's a treasurer of the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology. He's a past president of the American Clinical Neurophysiological Society and the American Board of Registration of the EEG and EP Technologies. Dr. Hussein is the author of more than 100 publications and nine books, including landmark studies on the treatment of refractory seizures and non-convulsive status epilepticus. His clinical interests include treatment of acute seizures, and status epilepticus, neurophysiological intraoperative monitoring, and general clinical neurophysiology. Today, his title is Clinical Visual Evoked Potentials. Clinical Visual Evoked Potentials are a useful way of neurophysiologically assessing the visual pathways beyond the eyes. There are many technical and interpretive nuances that must be remembered to ensure accurate interpretations. With examples, this lecture will review these nuances and at the end, several cases will be reviewed in the radiological and clinical context. Artif, we look for your presentation. Hello. So today I will talk about clinical visual evoked potentials and this lecture is meant to be a very clinical practical presentation and before i start i will show you my disclosures none of these are relevant to the presentation today and to give you an overview of the things we will talk about, I will start off by discussing an overview of visual evoked potentials and the anatomy of VEPs. We'll talk then, for the most part, about methodology, about how we obtain visual evoked potentials. We'll talk about the analysis. I'll spend a fair amount of time talking about abnormalities and how we localize these abnormalities. And towards the end, I will finish with a few cases from our center where visual evoked potentials have been valuable in identifying abnormalities. So let's start off with an overview. And the overview will start with a quick summary of the optic pathway. So hopefully this will be a review for many, but a quick analysis of the visual pathway shows us that as light comes into the eye, into the left eye, it comes in and uh, goes, there's light that goes to the uh, retina, both on the nasal half of the retina and the temporal half of the retina. The important thing to realize here is that light hitting the temporal half of the retina is actually coming from the nasal field and vice versa for the nasal half of the retina. It comes from the temporal field. The optic nerve in the back of the eye then carries fibers from both the nasal and the temporal aspects of the retina. Posteriorly, through the optic chiasm, where fibers from the nasal half of the retina decussate to the opposite side, whereas fibers from the temporal half of the retina stay ipsilaterally. They then go to the lateral geniculate body along with fibers from the contralateral side. After synapsing in the lateral geniculate body, they 
make their way to the occipital cortex, winding through the Myers loop in the temporal cortex, and finally finding their way in the calcarine cortex in the occipital lobe. An important point to appreciate is that in the optic nerve, fibers come from only the relevant eye, but in the optic tract, there's fibers from both eyes, and they're coming from the same visual field. In other words, fibers on the left side here are coming from the uh, nasal, I'm sorry, the, the temporal half of the left eye and the nasal half of the right eye, and vice versa for the right side. Another very important point is that once this visual pathway reaches the occipital cortex, the VEP generated is best seen in the contralateral hemisphere. In other words, the VEP generated in the right occipital cortex as shown will be best recorded over the left occipital cortex. In other words, the LO electrodes, and that is true for the other side as well. What are the different types of VEPs? There's many different types of VEPs. We're gonna spend our time today talking about VEPs to the checkerboard pattern, which is the most common clinical type of VEP that is performed. VEPs can also be performed to sign gratings that you see on the screen. They can be done to diffuse light, so-called flash VEPs. And one of the newer innovations in visual evoke potentials are multifocal VEPs, which are very helpful an analysis of demyelinating diseases such as MS. And what you see at the bottom is what a multifocal VEP might look like in terms of the stimulation. Before doing a VEP, the subject must be prepared. The things involved in subject preparation are that the individual must be seated in a chair. This is not a test we want to do with the individual lying in bed. The refractive error must be corrected. In other words, if the patient typically wears eyeglasses, they should be wearing their eyeglasses for this test or contact lenses if that's the case. The patient must remain alert. This is not a test in which we can afford the individual to get drowsy. They must be focused on the source of the stimulus. So they must be paying attention to the checkerboard pattern as it's being presented to them. One of the jobs of the technologist will be to make sure that the patient is paying attention to the checkerboard pattern. The non-stimulated eye should be covered and the individual, the patient, should focus on the full field stimulation. Now, when we do hemifield stimulation, the focus becomes critical. We're not gonna talk a lot about hemifield stimulation today, but if your laboratory is doing hemifield stimulation, you must really make certain that the individual patient is focused on whatever point you want them focused on. Just to start off, I'll give you an example of what might happen if you don't pay attention to these parameters. Here is an example of uh, a young individual who is being stimulated at a rate of 3.9 per second. You see the filter setting, you see the head size or the P to P, the preauricular to preauricular distance noted here. It's a fairly average distance. Uh, you see the scales presented here. Most of the VEP that I'll show you will have this data presented up front. This is the right eye. Both images are of the right eye. They're just obtained at different times. It's 150 repetitions. It's the 30. Uh, minute check size and you notice that the visual acuity is normal and the patient is wearing corrective lenses. So let's take a look at the image on the left first. You see that it is a, a fairly decent VEP. You see a P100 that's been tagged and if you approximate the latency of the P100, you notice that it is about 100 to maybe 105 or so milliseconds. But if you look at the image on the right, it is the exact same patient, the exact same eye, only obtained a few minutes later. And so what happened over here? So this is a 42-year-old male who intentionally is not focusing on the screen. So if the subject looks away from the stimulus or defocuses the stimulus, 
you can see how you might lose your VEP completely. And you may go from what looks like a fairly normal VEP to what looks like a fairly abnormal VEP. So attention to technique and attention to patient uh, uh, setup is critical in visual evoked potentials. Other subject variables that you should consider, sex has a bearing on latency as well. Women tend to have shorter VEP latencies. And in many laboratories, there are normative data that are different for men versus women. Our laboratory instead uses head size instead of sex. It gets to the same issue. Head size is a better way of looking at it, in my opinion. Visual acuity is another important aspect. You notice that in the sample I showed you, visual acuity was noted. You recall earlier that I said that in patient subject preparation, correcting refractive error is critical. A visual acuity that's less than 20 over 200 reduces amplitude and increases latency, potentially making your VEP abnormal. Pupillary size is very important. Sometimes patients will come to the laboratory after they've been to the ophthalmologist and have had their pupils dilated. That is not the time to do visually evoked potentials. Indeed, you need the pupillary size to be normal as extremes will affect the latency and the amplitude. Other stimulus variables that you should consider is rate. Uh, the faster you go, the more uh, difficult it will be to obtain a VEP. Remember that you're gonna be looking at a latency of at least 100 to 150 milliseconds, which means that your sweep will have to be at least 200 to 250 milliseconds. Because your sweep is that long, you're not gonna be able to go very fast in terms of frequency of stimulation. And so generally one to two per second up to about three to four per second is as fast as you can go. Generally one to two per second is used most often and it results in good reproducibility and reliability of waveforms. The faster you go, you can increase the latency and reduce the amplitude of the P100. Intensity of stimulation is also important. It's hard to conceptualize intensity of a VEP, but if you think about luminance or brightness of the contrast, they're slightly different things, but we'll use them relatively interchangeably right now. That can be thought of as the intensity of stimulation. In other words, the greater the difference between the white and the black squares, the greater the intensity of stimulation. And generally we say that the brightness contrast in a pattern light should be at least greater than 0.5. And the way you get to the 0.5 equation is shown on the screen, uh, which is contrast equals the luminance maximum, which is the luminance of the white square minus the luminance of the minimum, which is the luminance of the black square divided by a sum of the two. And again, as I said earlier, pupillary size becomes important because that also will affect the amount of light coming into the eye. How the stimulus is presented is also critically important. You see three different ways that a stimulus can be presented. It can be traditionally presented on a uh, CRT monitor, a cathode ray tube monitor that you see on the left side of your screen. These are the old time computer monitors. You can do it on a projection screen shown in the middle, or you can use the modern LED uh, um, uh, screens. So this says LED goggles, which is incorrect. What I meant to say here is an LED screen. Whichever paradigm you're using, you must ensure that you have obtained your normative data based on the stimulus presentation source that you would be using when testing patients. Here's why. Here is a 42 year old male wearing corrective lenses and focusing on the screen, doing everything he's supposed to be doing. You notice that the VEPs recorded here are very nice looking, highly reproducible. And there's no doubt here where the P100 is in each of these panels labeled A through D that you see on your screen. Notice also then in all of these panels, the stimulation rate stays the same at about 3.9 per second. The filter setting remain the same. Obviously the head size does not change. The amplitude um, 
settings and the latency settings remain the same at two microvolts per division and 25 milliseconds per division. This is all the right eye being stimulated. It's all with 150 repetitions. The visual angle does not change. The visual acuity obviously stays the same at 2020 because the individual is wearing corrective lenses. This is done back to back to back to back. In other words, there is no significant period of time where the individual is allowed to fall asleep or return on a separate day or whatever. This is the same eye being done sequentially. The only difference here is that the presentation screens are different. The one on the left is a CRT monitor, the one that we will typically use in our laboratory. The ones uh, labeled B, C, and D are with LCD monitors. The B panel is with a expensive LCD monitor that has a refresh rate of two milliseconds. C is with a moderately expensive LCD monitor that has a refresh rate of eight milliseconds. And the last one, D, is with an LCD screen that has a refresh rate of 30 milliseconds. So if you've ever had the experience of going to an electronic store, you will find many LCD monitors available for sale, ranging from very inexpensive ones to very expensive ones that are of the same size. And you wonder as to why some are much more expensive. And if you look at the details, one of the things that might be different is the refresh rate. And this becomes critically important when we do visual evoke potentials, you see how the latency changes. In a CRT monitor, if you glance over, your P100 comes in at 109 milliseconds. And your cheapest LCD monitor, the P100 comes in at 158 milliseconds. You've made a difference of almost 50 milliseconds in the P100 simply by changing the way you present the checkerboard pattern. So having an understanding of what your checkerboard pattern is doing and what effect it has on the latency is critical. If your CRT monitor dies and you switch to an LCD monitor, that is an opportunity for you to obtain new set of normative data based on your new LCD monitor. Recording parameters are fairly standard. They're listed here. The low frequency filter and the high frequency filter are noted. The sweep is typically sent at 250 milliseconds. Remember that your sweep should be at least twice the latency of your last waveform of interest. Your last waveform of interest is the P100, and sometimes it's the N105, sometimes even the N145. So you really want a sweep of about 200 to 250. The number of responsive average it is about 100 to 250. This is much lower than other types of VEPs because the I'm sorry, this is much lower than other types of evoked potentials because the VEP is really much larger in amplitude than other evoked potentials, such as brainstem and somatosensory evoked potentials. Interestingly, the polarity convention, in other words, whether the P100 goes up or down on the screen is not standardized. And depending on the laboratory that you're in, you may display it with negativity pointing up or negativity pointing down. There are two main methods of electrode placement that we use to record BEPs, the queen square method and the international 1020 system. The international 1020 system is based on the same criteria that we use to put on EEG electrodes and you see the nomenclature listed there. These electrodes are measured a, in a percentage wise basis, just as you would in the standard 1020 electrode application. The queen square method is slightly different. Instead of doing percentages of an individual's head, it has standardized measurements. And in the diagram that you see at the bottom, you see these listed. The MO is five centimeters above the, um, uh, the, the Indian, and the uh, mid frontal, the MF, is 12 centimeters back from the, M, uh, the, the nasium. And then you have the other electrodes that are measured symmetrically, the LO, the RO, five centimeters on the side of MO. The recording montage can be fairly variable. Uh, there is a recommended montage by the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society. I recommend you to take a look at that. 
we go a little bit beyond that. We have extra channels and uh, we, we uh, end up using them uh, just because they're available. So we will typically record these uh, uh, seven channels that you see on the right side of your screen. In our laboratory, we will typically display negativity upward, but again, recall that there isn't a standard and you can record negativity going downward. A number of laboratories will do that. So in our uh, laboratory, positivity will be going downward. So when you look at the P100, it will be going downward. Again, just a few words about our montage. We have the mid occipital to mid frontal, which will be a main derivation that you look at. Then we have the mid frontal to both ears. We have the mid occipital to both ears. And then we have the parasagittal derivation, the left and right occipital and the left and right temporal reference to both ears. So how do we look at the pattern reversal VEP. So when we start analyzing a VEP, we look for the expected peaks of interest, and those are gonna be the N75, the P100, and the N145, and these are gonna be present in the midline as well as in the parasagittal derivation, but typically they will be of the highest amplitude in the midline. You see on the screen in the top channel, you see the N75, the P100 going downward, and the N145 noted. If you come four channels down, you see a N105. This is being recorded from the frontal eye field. This is recorded from the MF to AU derivation, the mid frontal to AU derivation. This waveform is only seen in the frontal head regions. So understand that when you have a derivation that's an MO to MF derivation, you will not only have the P100, which is a positive waveform, but you will factor in the N105 as well because your reference electrode is the MF. And so what you will see is a aggregate waveform that includes both the P100 and the N105, but they do not cancel each other out because both of them will be going in the same direction even though one is negative and the other is positive. And that is because the negativity is in the reference electrode. So what do we measure? We will typically measure the latency of the P100. We will measure the amplitude. And depending on your laboratory, you may measure the la amplitude between the N75 and the P100 or between the P100 and the N145. Or you can take an average of these two. Again, different labs have different protocols that they use. Another very important thing to look at is the topography. In other words, is the LO, the lateral occipital, and the RO, I'm sorry, the left occipital and the RO, the right occipital, do the waveforms recorded in those two derivations, do they look the same? Is the topography symmetric? We then look at the morphology as well. Does it look like a normal visual evoked potential or does it have an abnormal morphology? Does it have a W shape? W shape will have different significance that we'll talk about in just a bit. When we talk about the topography, I just want to spend another minute on the topography. Recall that when we simulate one eye, in this case, the right eye is being simulated, the right eye is stimulated in the entire visual field of that eye, which means that the nasal and the temporal retina get activated, which means the entire optic nerve is activated. Once you get to the optic chiasm, recall that the nasal fibers will cross over to the contralateral side, the temporal fibers will stay ipsilateral, so half the fibers are transmitting contralaterally, half are transmitting ipsilaterally. They both will go through the lateral geniculate body, through the Myers loop, up to both occipital uh, cortices. Remember, I also told you that when the right occipital cortex is activated, the VEP, in fact, projects over to the left side of the head and so you will record it better over the LO electrode. And similarly, when you activate the left occipital cortex, you will record that better over the RO electrodes. And that's what you see over here, is that in the midline, you see the highest amplitude, but on the two sides, you see the contralateral occipital cortex projecting. And that's what these arrows are representing, the red and the blue arrow. This is the normative data at Duke University.
And you notice that our normative data is based on head size, which is a P2P measurement. Again, we do not differentiate between male, female head size. We simply measure head size and determine what our normative data is. And you see as the head gets larger, our normative data suggests that the latency of the P100 gets longer and longer. Note that this is three standard deviations beyond the mean, which means that if the value that you're getting for the P100 is greater than 117 for a 39 centimeter P2P size, that means that is an abnormality. You don't have to go three standard deviation beyond 117. 117 is that three standard deviations. So what do we consider abnormal? We consider an interocular latency difference of greater, equal to or greater than eight milliseconds as abnormal. So if it's less than eight milliseconds, that's considered normal. An interocular amplitude difference of the P100, however you measure it, whether it's the N75 to the P100 or the P100 to the N145, however you measure it, an interocular amplitude difference of two or greater is considered abnormal. And then finally, a parasagittal amplitude difference. So LO to RO difference of equal to or greater than 2.5 is considered abnormal. So that is the criteria that we use to measure abnormality in these waveforms. Speaking of abnormalities, let's transition and talk about how we think about abnormalities and how we localize these abnormalities. And what I will show you in the next few slides is a series of lesions in the optic pathway and what effect these will have on a full field simulation. You can extrapolate from this what will happen in a hemifield simulation. I won't go over into hemifields because those are not done as often. But let's start. We'll start off by putting a lesion one here in the left optic nerve. So these are not obviously drawn to scale, but notice that the off, uh, left optic nerve is that initial segment between the eye and the optic chiasm. So we put the lesion in the left optic nerve here. We do a full field simulation on the left side and notice on the table on the right, we've simulated the left eye, it's lesion one. You've got the midline derivation indicated as MO, and you've got the left and the right occipital derivations indicated as LO and RO. So notice that this is a lesion in the optic pathway. Nothing gets through. You don't get a waveform in any of the three derivations that I've shown you. When you stimulate the contralateral eye, on the other hand, you activate both the nasal and the temporal part of the retina of the right eye. They come through the right optic nerve, through the optic chiasm, through both optic tract to both visual cortices, and you get a waveform on both sides as well as on the midline because there is no obstruction to that flow of information. So you see a VEP in the LO, the RO, and indeed the biggest one in the MO. Let's change our lesion and now create lesion two in the optic chiasm as shown in the diagram on the left. Now again, we will stimulate the left side. Now when the left side is stimulated, now here notice that there is no lesion one, lesion one is gone, all you have is lesion two. You've stimulated the left eye, full field simulation, you've activated both the nasal and the temporal aspect of the retina of that eye. You've activated the entire optic nerve. Now notice that Fibers from the temporal aspect of the retina will not decussate, will not go to the opposite side, will stay ipsilateral, and will come up to the visual cortex on the left side. And when that happens, you see a waveform that's recorded over the right occipital cortex and over MO. However, the fibers going through the optic chiasm, which are fibers coming from the temporal aspect of the retina, do not cross over to the right occipital cortex. Therefore, the right occipital cortex is not activated. Therefore, the LO, the contralateral electrode, does not demonstrate your P100. So you get something comparable to what is shown on the table on your right. Now we're gonna move that stimulation over to the right eye. This is the right full field simulation.
And what you have is the opposite of what I showed you previously. In other words, now you've simulated full field on the right. After right-sided simulation, again, the nasal fibers will get stuck. They will not go over to the left side. They will not activate the left occipital cortex. You will then not see a RO waveform. You will indeed go over to the right occipital cortex. You will activate the right occipital cortex and thus be able to see a waveform on the left occipital electrode and the mid occipital electrode. And now we will finally put in our third lesion, which will be in the optic tract. So this will be post chiasmatic. Again, we will stimulate our left eye first. It's going to be a full field stimulation. Again, we've activated nasal and temporal aspects of the retina. Notice that the fibers will activate, come down. They will be able to go over to the contralateral side because there is no lesion in the optic chiasm at this point. They will go over to the right occipital cortex. And therefore, you will see a waveform, an LO waveform, in the left occipital electrodes and also in the mid occipital electrodes as shown in the table on your right. But when you stimulate the right eye, again, the entire visual field is activated, but this time the nasal fibers that cross over to the contralateral side do not make it to the visual cortex. The left visual cortex does not get activated. Therefore, you do not record a RO waveform. On the other hand, you do activate the temporal aspect of the right eye, you do activate the right occipital cortex, and therefore you do see a LO and an MO waveform. So now notice on your table what you've got. What you've got is what is known as a crossed pattern of abnormality and a uncrossed pattern of abnormality. And what I mean by that is when you look at the last number three lesion, which is the post plasmatic lesion, Regardless of whether you stimulate the left or the right eye, the lost waveform will stay on the same side, a uncrossed abnormality. On the other hand, when the lesion is in the optic chiasm, the lost waveform will switch from side to side depending on which side you've activated, which is referred to as a crossed abnormality. So depending on whether the lesion is in the chiasm or retrochiasmatic or post you have either a crossed or an uncrossed abnormality. Having told you all of that, let's talk a little bit about our localization strategy. Once we see these prolongations or loss of waveform, again, remember that loss of waveform is the most extreme abnormality. Uh, if the lesion is not extreme, you might see a latency prolongation or loss in amplitude. So keep that in mind as we go through the localization strategy. So let's say we have a latency prolongation. We have a unilateral latency prolongation. What do we think of? Uh, unilateral latency prolongation is typically a pre chiasmatic lesion. This is the kind of abnormality you expect to find in individuals who have optic neuritis or multiple sclerosis. However, if the latency prolongation is bilateral, all bets are off. It certainly could be a pre lesion, but it could also be a chiasmatic lesion, it could be a post chiasmatic lesion, or it could be a technical issue that has happened. And so now you have to look at other derivations to figure out whether it's one of these other types of abnormalities or localization is in one of these other locations. Moving on to amplitude, again, a unilateral lost amplitude, again, you're gonna think about a pre chiasmatic lesion, especially if the contralateral side is normal. However, sometimes a lost amplitude or a lost waveform could be a technical issue as well. So you want, it behooves you to make sure that you have resolved all technical issues before you call a waveform as abnormal. Again, similar to latency prolongation, if you've got a bilateral loss of amplitude, all bets are off, and it could be any one of these four things. Let's move on to topography. We talked about this a little bit. Crossed asymmetry, recall, refers to a chiasmatic lesion, whereas a uncrossed asymmetry is typically a post-chiasmatic lesion. 
How about a pre-cosmetic lesion? Again, recall that that is a unilateral abnormality and that's why I've not discussed it in topography. How about morphology? How about a W-shaped waveform? Recall I talked about a W-shaped waveform early on. That's when a P100 doesn't have just one nice peak or valley. It has a double valley or a double peak, if you will. When you have a W-shaped waveform, there are two main things that you should think about. One is a technical issue. And that means that if you have a derivation such as a MO to MF, that could sometimes show you a W-shaped waveform. And now if you look at a MF, I'm sorry, an MO to AU derivation, that W-shaped waveform may go away. That is what I refer to as a technical issue. Or if you change the check size, it may go away. There is a number of studies that have looked at a W-shaped waveform and have found that that may be the case in patients who have optic neuritis or multiple sclerosis, in other words, have a pre-cosmetic lesion. So the two commonest uh, causes of a W-shaped waveform are going to be pre-cosmetic or technical. Now, having said that, certainly a W-shaped waveform can be seen in a cosmetic or a post-cosmetic, uh, but that is less common. All right, having told you the localization strategy, the various types of abnormalities, and gone through the basics of how we obtain a pattern reversal VEP, let's look at a few cases and work our way through them. So typically when you will be shown VEPs, they will show up like this, the left side and the right side. Typically the left side is on your left, the right side is on your right. You may or may not have any clinical information, but you will have the waveforms tagged as they are here. Notice the hand-drawn arrow uh, denoting positivity with a downward arrow. This should be present in every evoke potential. This indicates how you have displayed your waveforms. Here we are displaying our positivity downward. In other words, your P100 is going to be pointing downward. Other important things to look at is your sensitivity settings are two microvolts per division. Your time base is 25 milliseconds per division. So even though the P100 is given to us at 109 milliseconds, we can estimate that ourselves by counting the divisions, which is a little over four divisions. So 109 seems accurate. So it's 109 on the left, and then we look at the right-sided waveforms, it's 121 on the right. We want to confirm that. We count the individual divisions, and indeed it's almost five divisions, which would be 125, uh, um, because it's a 25 milliseconds per division screen. And so the labels appear to be accurate. The other thing we want to look at is what is the morphology and what is the topography of our waveform? Is this a single peak waveform? Indeed, it appears so. It does not appear to have a W-shaped morphology. We want to look at our topography. Is the LO and the RO waveform symmetric? And we look down towards the bottom of these derivations, LO to MF and RO to MF are noted there. And even though we don't have the amplitude measurements here, simply eyeballing them would suggest that they're not greater than two and a half times the other. And from side to side, they're not greater than twice their counterpart. And so the parasagittal derivations appear grossly symmetric and normal. Now here's a little bit of history. This is a 30-year-old female with impaired vision in her right eye. For the last month, she has a history of right-sided optic neuritis several years ago that improved with steroids. And this is her MRI. You see the arrow pointing to a swollen optic nerve, as might be seen in optic neuritis. And so what you see here is a very classic example of what might be seen in optic neuritis. Notice that the waveform on the right side or after right eye stimulation, looks like a very normal looking P100. In other words, if you did not look at the latency, you would be tempted to say that that is a normal looking VEP. And that is typical for a demyelinating waveform. It looks very normal. It's just a lot delayed compared to the normal counterpart. And remember, because this is a unilateral latency prolongation, our localization here 
is pre-chiasmatic, which indeed is what is seen in the MRI as well. Here's another example. I give you the history up front here, 66 year old female undergoing evaluation for a rapidly progressive dementia. She is sleepy and is unable to maintain focus on the pattern reversal VEP stimulus screen. What you see on the left is a very broad VEP. The peak is tagged in the middle as it ought to be. It's at 121 milliseconds. If you look at the parasatural derivations towards the bottom, it's not clear if they're necessarily tagged at the peak, but they look symmetric nonetheless. And then you look on the right side. The one thing that should strike you immediately is that it's not replicated. There's only a single derivation, that is, a single run that is shown. Now remember in evoke potential, you never want to look at just one run. Everything must be replicated at least once. And, and, and if unreliable, then more than once. There's only a single repetition here. Now, why might that be the case? Well, in this case, notice that in the history, you get she is sleepy un and unable to maintain focus on the stimulus screen. And so what has happened here is that the patient's unable to continue to focus, she falls asleep, and this is all the data that our technologists are able to get. And so you get this and you're trying to interpret it, the interpretation for this ought to be that this is uninterpretable. It's not interpretable because the patient has been unable to maintain a focus on the screen. And so a prolongation of 121 may indeed be a perfectly normal VEP if she were able to maintain focus. Recall that one of the first studies I showed you was an individual who was not focusing on the screen. And you notice how that waveform was almost not visible. And so maintaining focus is very important just because the latency appears prolonged doesn't mean that this is interpreted as an abnormal study. Here's another example. Just simply looking at the waveform morphology, this looks like a well-replicated waveform on the left and on the right side. The P100 is clearly evident. When you look down at the parasagittal derivations, they are, appear to be symmetric. From left to right, they appear to be symmetric as well. You can even see a N105 waveform. Having identified all of these, you want to look at the latencies as well. So the latency on the left is 116. The latency on the right is 126. You can confirm these by counting the various check boxes to make sure that these are labeled correctly and the computer has generated the correct data. We will assume for a moment that indeed it has. There is a clear asymmetry between the left and the right side. And so on the left side, 116 does appear to be slightly prolonged, but the main question you want to ask here is what is the P to P distance? Is this going to be normal for head size? So over here, what you're seeing is a prolongation on the right side, and this is the abnormality on the MRI that you see. This is an individual who's 47 years old and has burning dysesthesias of the right upper extremity. She has not had previous neurologic symptoms. So is the lesion that you see on the MRI scan, which is in the left hemisphere, accounting for this abnormality? I would say the two are unrelated in the sense that I doubt that that lesion is causing this abnormality. Might they both be related to the same underlying condition? Absolutely. But I don't think that that lesion is causing the abnormality that you're seeing in the VEP. The VEP is a unilateral prolongation, perhaps. Alternatively, it may be a bilateral prolongation. You just don't know because the 116 may be prolonged as well. So if you can get the data for that, if you can figure out the head size, you might in fact be able to localize this a little bit better. Here's yet another waveform. The left side is on the left, the right side is on the right. Notice that on the left side, there is really no identifiable P100. 
While on the right side, there does appear to be a P100. You can even argue that there may be somewhat of a, P, uh, a W-shaped waveform, but there does appear to be a, a deeper peak, which is tagged as the P100. Notice that the parasagittal derivations do not look very good, but they don't look very reliable either. This is an 18-year-old female with bilateral eye pain and vision loss. Left greater than right, she has a history of optic neuritis, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, membranous nephritis, and thrombocytopenia. Clearly, she's got many medical issues. How do you interpret this? This appears to be a bilateral abnormality. Clearly, there's prolongation on the right and loss of waveform on the left. The left, you could have wondered whether it's a technical issue. The right being as abnormal as it is suggests that perhaps the left is abnormal as well. And so if you look at her MRI scan, you notice that she's got enhancement in her optic chiasm, as well as abnormal signal in both mesial temporal structures. Just looking at the VEP itself, it is a difficult VEP to localize. Certainly, it is one that could be either chiasmatic or post-chiasmatic. You don't have the advantage of having reliable parasagittal derivation, so you can't really tell whether this is a crossed or an uncrossed asymmetry, but that is potentially something that you would have looked for had you been able to see the parasagittal derivations. So I'll wrap up here and remind you that VEPs are an important test to assess the physiological integrity of the visual system. Attention to detail of how the VEP is obtained, what the subject is doing, what the patient is doing while the test is being run is critical and it must be compared to normative data. Replacing stimulating and recording equipment can have a significant impact. I showed you the impact of changing the screen, going from a CRT monitor to an LCD monitor can have a remarkable effect on the latency of your waveforms. You must assess all waveforms, including the parasagittal derivations, as they may give you valuable information. And finally, pre-chiasmal, chiasmal, and post-chiasmal localization can be possible if you look at appropriate derivations and analyze them appropriately. And I'll end here. Thank you. Artif, thank you very much. Excellent presentations. Uh... Not sure if everybody hears me. I can hear you. Okay, fine. So we have three questions. May I start with question of Shugu Zuvazano. Does N105 make a dipole with P100? Interesting question. And um, the answer is probably not. Uh, the latency is slightly different. Many studies uh, suggest that the N105 is actually coming from the frontal eye fields and is generated locally, whereas the P100 is coming from the occipital eye fields that is generated locally. So it's probably not a single dipole, but certainly when you record a P100 uh, from a derivation that's MO, mid-occipital to MF, mid-frontal, you look at both of these waveforms, they're going in opposite directions, so that gives you the advantage of a larger amplitude uh, uh, P100 waveform. We have two questions from uh, Mr. Zachin. I think they have already been answered. They were raised very early do the, uh, during the talk. If not, please uh, question again. Then we have a next question from Maria. Georgala, does the pattern reversal stimulate the whole optic nerve or only the central vision? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And the answer lies in uh, the check size. The larger the check size, the more of the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the retina uh, you're stimulating, the more of the visual field you're stimulating. Uh, and the smaller the check size, the smaller the visual field that you're stimulating. The smaller the check size, uh, the visual field around the fovea centralis will be stimulated. So ideally, you want to stimulate the smallest possible or use the smallest possible check size because you then limit the amount of retina that you've stimulated. And by stimulate, using a small check size, you, you stimulate only the part of the retina that contains the highest number 
of cones, which will give you the best looking VEP. The problem with that is that the smaller the check size, the greater the difficulty you potentially may have in resolving the white and the black squares. If you have a difficulty in resolving those squares, in other words, if you have a refractive error, then that will affect your VEP latency and amplitude. So what you have to do is get to a perfect balance of check size as well as visual acuity that will resolve that check size. So for many people that ends up being a 30 minute check size, um, and that's how we will typically start that will activate most of the central part of the retina uh, and predominantly the fovea centralis. However, if at the beginning of the test we have checked visual acuity and that ends up being not 2020, then we may elect to increase the check size to a 60 minute check size to see if that helps improve the VEP. Alternatively, if the patient has 15 over 20 visual acuity, you could go down to a 15 minute check size to see if that improves visual, uh, the P100. Atif, thank you. I may add uh, that the visual acuity is uh, at around one um, second uh, uh, of resolution, whereas uh, optimal response is acquired by one minute. So we are 60 times course and uh, sometimes people want to do an objective refractometry which can be done but you have to go to very small patterns and then your uh, results will be more difficult to obtain. Now we can continue with anonymous observer. Can blind patients have a normal VEP Google? Uh, right, so uh, the answer is potentially yes. Um, now remember that in blind people, you cannot get a pattern reversal VEP. So what I have been talking about is someone who's looking at a checkerboard pattern. If you're blind, obviously you cannot look at the checkerboard pattern. In those patients, we will use what is known as flash VEPs. So this is with a bright light. Uh, with a flash VEP, even someone who has very poor visual acuity, um, it can have a uh, normal P100 uh, or a P1 response as it's often called. Remember that a P1 response or a P100 that is obtained with a flash uh, um, stimulus is not the same thing and doesn't necessarily follow the exact same pathways as a pattern reversal VEP. And if you have even some connections between the optic nerve and the visual cortex, you will likely get a P, uh, P100 or a P1 response. That doesn't mean that the patient is able to see. The visual acuity may be remarkably impaired, or as you say, the patient may be blind, and you may still get the P100. If you do not have a, a flash VEP, if the flash VEP is absent, then it is very likely that the patient is unable to see. Okay, so the have, converse is often true, but what you have asked may or may not be true. Yeah. Nakla Gadala is asking, if you have a machine with two channels only, how can we use it for VEP? Many, I may add many uh, labs uh, just to record one channel only. Are yeah, how? yeah. So, so if you have a single channel, then it is very difficult to look at anything other than pre-chasmatic abnormalities. And you should not really attempt to try to look at retrochasmal abnormalities. You can do one at a time and move things around, but that would be a very tedious way of doing it and the patient may lose concentration uh, and such. And so you're, you're better off uh, looking simply at uh, the midline electrode, the MO electrode, and looking for pre-chasmatic abnormalities. Quite frankly, 90%, 95% of the time that we do this test, it is to look for pre-chasmatic abnormalities, not for chasmatic or retrochasmatic abnormalities, which are often also very easily found with imaging studies. Uh, at that stage, I may add that we, if we're looking for retrochasmatic abnormalities, we go for half-field stimulation. You didn't mention that. Yes, you're absolutely right. Hemifield simulation is very useful and can be done. 
I purposely didn't do it because there's relatively few laboratories currently that are uh, doing hemi-field simulation. It is technically uh, much more challenging and the interpretation is, is more difficult. But if you, that is absolutely a possibility. But again, if you only have a single channel machine, then the probability that you will be doing hemi-field simulation is, is probably low. Well, I may add, as you said already, it, it's time consuming. So you could ask the subject to look at the left corner of the screen or the right corner, and then you have to move the electrode to the ipsilateral side. So it takes simply time and you have to do your own standardized values for everything. This is, I think, the answer. So right. is there any clinical role for the SSVEP by asked by John Freddy Okua Gomez? Um, so SSVEP, I'm not sure what the SS... I think steady state probably. Steady state, right. So steady state VEP, um, I have not used clinically. There are research applications. I showed you uh, in one of my early slides, steady state VEP is when there is no uh, fixed gradient between white and black and what you get is a continuous uh, uh, waveform. Um, so I don't uh, know of uh, any clinical value to this, uh, unless Walter, you do. I think this has been used in research studies yeah. um, for various reasons. I think there may be a cross-link to your interesting patient with dementia. So if you, if you have a, a really non-cooperative patient, you may have a, a weak form of, let's say, alpha entrainment by um, steady state um, pattern reversal in these drowsy patients. And you see, you can identify that in the very early beginning, you see already a kind of upbuild of an alpha rhythm or so. But we are not using steady state in the clinical context as well, I have to add, yeah. So, um, is hemi-stimulation more accurate for diagnosing chiasmal lesion by Nagla Gadala? Yes, absolutely. Hemi-field stimulation is much more useful uh, in, in chiasmal and retrochiasmal. So anytime you see chiasmal or retrochiasmal abnormal um, lesions, uh, you're better off moving to a hemifield simulation if you have the technical capability of doing that. Next question by Sanya Kotara. Thank you for the great lecture. Can you tell us the best resources to read more on this subject? I may, since Artif has a conflict of interest, he wrote excellent books in that area. I may answer this question, but in addition, Art, if you may have other recommendations. Right, so a very nice textbook on evoked potentials by Dr. Kappa uh, from uh, Ma Massachusetts General Hospital is, is, uh, is sort of the reference for evoked potentials. I would highly recommend that. It is hard to find. I believe it is out of print, but if you can get a hold of that book, it is a, it is a nice book, uh, reference book to, to review. Okay, next question by Hanan Al-Shankiri. Would the result of VEP be affected if the patient has pattern of photic sensitivity? Uh, so photic uh, sensitivity, uh, I believe not. Uh, however, you must be careful in, in, in someone who has photic sensitivity. In other words, if someone has uh, uh, photogenic epilepsy or something to that effect, then that would be concerning to do uh, this type of a VEP and whether that might provoke abnormalities and certainly doing flash VEPs may be problematic in that individual. Next question by Jorge Guiteres. I may mention that Jorge is a chapter Le, uh, the the pre chapter president of our South American chapter and uh, during our past Washington meeting, they in a competition, they turned out to, to be the best qualified chapter of all the four chapters. So Hoga asks, would you use parasitical asymmetry as a warning criteria during VEP interoperative monitoring? Uh, interesting question, uh, Jorge. I, the answer, short answer is no, I would not. Uh, and that is simply because the uh, reliability of VEPs in the operating room is such that I try to rely only on the midline electrode. Um, and as you are well aware, even the reliability of that is, is uh, uh, sometimes questionable. So I worry about uh, 
being overly sensitive in the operating room. And so I have not used uh, the parasagittals for operative monitoring. So next question by Shugo Zuvazono. How many number of subjects are sufficient to obtain a normal range for each head size? Yeah, so um, uh, it again, depends on, on your variability, but uh, uh, about 20 is uh, what we have used in the past. Well, I may add here that if you publish a scientific paper in uh, the area of clinical neurophysiology, the reviewers usually ask for 20 subjects somewhere in that. And our statisticians say we are not interested in effect sizes uh, requiring more than 20 subjects. So I think I, I would agree roughly uh, this number, but the more the better, of course. Now, Aquip is asking with first case presentation, is there a way to differentiate that abnormality identified is related to current presentation or previous episode of optic neuritis? Sometimes patients with previous history of of optic neuritis present with subjective worsening of symptoms without any objective signs. Can VEP help in that scenario? No, it's a great question. And unfortunately, this does not differentiate the timing of the abnormality. Indeed, in many patients who have had a history of optic neuritis, the VEP abnormality uh, persists. And in fact, that is often why the VEP is obtained. In other words, uh, the visual acuity has improved and uh, you're looking for another lesion in space and time, and whereas you cannot find it on, on uh, imaging, you do this test to indeed find the, uh, uh, the optic neuritis that occurred perhaps a long time ago by history. Uh, so no, the VEP unfortunately doesn't help you time the lesion, it just tells you that the lesion is there. In, in that context, I may add that you, you, many are aware that the classification of multiple sclerosis um, only kept the visually evoked potentials and uh, got rid of the somatosensory and uh, acoustic evoked potentials. Nevertheless, recording uh, evoked potentials is a strong tool to be able to differentiate between demyelinating and axonal lesions. And I also want to draw a cross link to uh, central scotoma by non-demyelinating lesions. So if you have, a, for instance, a patient with labus optic atrophy with a central scotoma, you may get a reversal of the uh, PNP complex at the occipital cortex and erroneously then misinterpret the negative uh, component. So in order to get a reliable uh, conclusion about the delay of the P100, you need to be sure that there is no central scotoma by um, a parameter. Next question by Amado Tello, would you recommend use 16 and 32 minute squares if you suspect multiple sclerosis as a challenge test? Yeah, that's an interesting um, uh, way to look at it. Certainly there is a school of thought that suggests that if you can find any abnormality, that that is an abnormality. Uh, the way in my laboratory that we interpret is that if you can make it normal in any uh, check size, the test is normal. Uh, certainly by starting off at a 30 minute check size is reasonable. Um, going to a, a 15 minute or as you say, a 16 minute check size is okay. But what you have to be careful about is that if the visual acuity is, uh, is not optimal, which often it isn't in a case of, uh, of prior MS, uh, prior optic neuritis, the change in the VEP may be due to the change in visual acuity rather than the demyelination. So you, you just have to be very careful when you do that. Uh, my own uh, laboratory, we, we start off at a 30 minute check size and most individuals with relatively normal visual acuity and then go from there. Okay, then we have a question by Asma. Thank you for a great lecture during interoperative monitoring. Can you use the same montage? You can use the same montage. I try to limit the montage in the operating room because of time and because of complexity. And I will typically have an MO, uh, LO and RO uh, um, uh, electrode. And I will often reference that to Ipsy ear rather than the MF, which oftentimes ends up being uh, in, the, in the operative field. So I use a slightly limited version of what I've shown you in the operating room. Remember also that VEPs in the operating room are not a standard modality and their absolute value in the operating room is yet to be established. Having said that, I have used it, but in a more limited manner. 
So are there any more questions? Yes. Any recommendations for VEP check size for specific pathology NMOMS? How to differentiate between axonal and demyelinating pathology in VEP? Yeah, no specific recommendations for check size. Uh, again, starting with 30, as I said, is reasonable. There is a way to differentiate between the pathologies, uh, and that has to do with the degree of uh, abnormality. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the degree of latency prolongation. In other words, demyelinating abnormalities tend to prolong the VEP much more remarkably than exonal uh, problems such as ischemic optic neuropathy. Also, as I mentioned, uh, the morphology of the P100 stays relatively intact um, uh, in, in a demyelinating neuropathy as opposed to an ischemic neuropathy where the morphology of the waveform becomes much more erratic and much more difficult to identify. So you can use the latency as well as the morphology of the waveform to help you uh, suggest a potential abnormality. These are not absolutes and you cannot rely on it for sure to say that this is one or the other. We have another question. Can you remind, by, by Yaha Naji, can you remind us the normal latency, rates of latency and amplitude? I may add at that stage that I was really impressed having seen your comparison between the different types of screens. So the, the related question is, of course, was that controlled for luminance? You know that the brighter uh, uh, stimulus is faster it arrives at the visual cortex and you can this is a well-known uh, psychological phenomenon the so-called pulvish phenomenon so if you darken one eye by a gray filter and have a pendulum swinging you see it as an e uh, eclipse so uh, it may simply be that the very long latencies with these googles were due to a loss or reduction in luminance Actually, we standardized that as well and made sure that uh, that yeah. uh, stayed above uh, uh, 90 or, or uh, in fact, above 0.95. And the normal rates of latency and amplitude, you may comment again on that since this is a very... Sure. I mean, so the P100 theoretically has a latency of 100 milliseconds, but again, highly dependent on head size. Mm -hmm. And so... Even in a small head, you might expect it to be about 105 to 110 uh, milliseconds. The normative data I showed you was three standard deviations above mean. So something to keep in mind. Uh, I may add at that stage, if you compare acoustic and somatosensory evoked potentials, you must be aware that the, v, uh, the P100 is very late and the time is lost actually in the retina. So the transmission from cones to bipolar cells is uh, not driven by spikes, but on an analog way. And if you look at the uh, electroretinography and then early visual evoked potentials, which we did decades ago in color evoked potentials, the cortical signal starts at 60 milliseconds and the P100 has a lot of processing already. Yes. So um, next uh, question by uh, Yi Yuang Huang. Would habituation effect affect the representation of VEP such as visual stimuli are presented repetitively with short SOA? Um, so if you are presenting at a, a latency, uh, at, at a frequency of one to two cycles per second or one to two hertz, the habituation shouldn't be an issue, but if you go much faster, then that may be the case. I, I remember that people were looking at fatiguing VEPs if you do them for a long time. And uh, very long years ago, we, um, in a psychology experiment, we were asked just to record VEPs with a small pattern and then uh, the next round to count the number and to get a much uh, higher uh, amplitude. So the attention plays a role, I think. So uh, we so have- Attention, uh, absolutely attention is, is critical. Um, so uh, if, if the intent of the question was fatiguing, then that sort of was similar to the first uh, slide I showed or the first example I showed when the patient intentionally is looking away or defocusing, mm -hmm. tension would have very similar effects that if you sort of look away from the screen or not mm -hmm. paying attention to the checkerboard pattern, then that would have the same effect. So we have answered 19 questions.
Atif, thank you very much. If there are no you, more Arthur. questions, <laughs> no more questions, uh, we uh, are so. And I think we have an announcement for, I may start with the announcement. We have the next masterclass at November 7 in um, interoperative neurophysiological monitoring. And I may also add that uh, the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology is planning the next hopefully on-site meeting uh, in Geneva in early September 2022. So another two years to go and hopefully we will uh, have gotten rid of COVID at that time. So Atif, again, thank you very much. Thank all the uh, participants for their lively discussion and have a nice Saturday. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.